Okay, so um, kind of a, I'm, I'm the guy that has to follow Dr. McCann, so uh, <laughs> pressure's on me. But um, so quick intro, my name's Han Sang Bay. I work for Citi, uh, formerly known as Citi Group. And um, I, I have a couple different roles at Citi. Um, I own some of the network management t tools that we have, faults, alerting, uh, capacity management. Um, I also have another role where I have a team of people that troubleshoot application and network issues. So over the course of the year, I always cherry pick these interesting problems that we see on the network and, uh, and, I, say, and I squirrel them away for a presentation at SharkFest. And um, so everything that you see here happened in real life. It was a real life troubleshooting and, uh, and I kind of show you how we use the different tools and Wireshark in this case to solve these problems. And the title, Packet Trace Whispering, seems kind of hokey. But the, the reason why I chose that is because some of these problems are kind of simple, right? If, uh, if you're an expert uh, in doing protocol analysis, a lot of this should jump out immediately and, um, and you can re resolve them. What I found though is um, if s someone who's an expert in protocol analysis takes two, three minutes and says, oh, here you go, here's a problem, to someone who's not very well versed, it can take hours, right? Because you don't quite know what to look for, right? And that's, and that's fundamentally, the, there is no Google for Wireshark, right? You can't just type some search terms and tell me what the hell's wrong. Um, that, that button hasn't been, uh, um, so, so one of the things that I do in this session is I show you some of the newer features of Wireshark that I had nothing to do with. But I'd like to thank the developers, the core developers that keep adding functions and features. And one of those that I'll use in this presentation um, is quite useful, right? So I'd like to show you some kind of the tips and, tr tips and tricks of the trade um, when we do the, um, the tr um, packet analysis. Okay, so the first one, pretty routine. We put in new routers, new infrastructure into a data center and the application folks call and say, it's not working. So most of you are probably, I'm assuming, router, routing and switching type people. Um, of course, the first thing is the network's not working. And then we always shoot back with the application's not working. Um, but when there's packet loss, and it's bursty packet loss, it's not kind of a black holing, but kind of a bursty packet loss, chances are it's the network that's doing it. There's either buffer starvation, uh, there's congestion somewhere. So it's probably the infrastructure. So more than any other type of problem, when you have packet loss, um, you need to start looking at the network as the uh, usual suspect, okay? So in this particular case, a new international circuit, new data center, they're doing testing, and sure enough, something doesn't work. And it was a Unix-based uh, that uses SSH, you know, log in, get some interactive screen through SSH tunnel, et cetera, and it's not working. So they were troubleshooting for about two weeks, um, finally kind of goes up through multiple layers, gets to my application performance team to look at. And so let's take a look at the trace itself. So I get an email, Hansai, this isn't working, can you help? So we said, all right. So you bring up the Wireshark, and notice what I have here, right? So this time column here is the default time since the beginning of the packet capture, very useful. I also add the delta column here directly. Now, you can actually change this time field that comes up as default, and you can come up here under view and time display format and change it to whatever you want, okay? But I also like to see in context, and I'll show you why I do this, the separate column for delta and time. I also like to see the length. So this is actually, for me, it helps quite a bit when I'm troubleshooting because um, things will start to jump out at you, right? So one of the things about protocol analysis is really it's um, looking for patterns. And I, and I repeat this every year, but if you look for patterns, your brain has this incredible power to filter out things that don't matter and it'll start to, your eyes will automatically focus on something that doesn't seem right, right? And it only comes with practice. So one of my colleagues who's here actually is in the basic course said, when he opens up Wireshark, he opens it up, he stares intently at the screen, but don't know where to go after that, right? Because there's a lot of information here, right? And he said, you know, I usually open up all these tabs, and, uh, but I don't really know what I'm looking for, right? So the goal of this session is to help you guide 
and kind of shine that big spotlight to problems. So the first thing I do, and I'm, I'm kind of giving you um, what we do when we do troubleshooting, and the first thing that I do without fail is this. I'm looking for flags or TCP behavior that Wireshark thinks is wrong. And clearly, we have things that show up, retransmission. So what causes retransmissions? It could be congestion, it could be packet loss, it could be a lot of things. It could be fake packet loss too, right? And in last year's session, I went into some where uh, the monitoring capability caused Wireshark to think packets were lost when in fact they weren't, right? And there are some ways, tips and tricks to figure, out, figure that portion out. And if you go to last year's session, uh, I dealt with that. So what's the first thing that pops up in this screen? Someone kind of describe what you see on the screen. Again, this is all about picking up patterns, looking for commonalities, etc. Give me some, uh, anybody? I'm sorry, you're going to have to speak up. I can't. They're all close together. Okay, so they're kind of close together. How do we know that? We got the packet numbers here, right? So it's, we're losing in bunches, right? Because we, you see this here that it's not jumping all over the place. What else? I'm sorry? The delta, okay. So look at the delta here. 2, 5, 10, 20. So when you're doing protocol analysis, there are certain numbers and boundary conditions you should look for, right? Certain numbers, right? And everybody that's done comp sci, um, you know, whether it's based on 1024, multiples thereof, 2 to the 4, etc., these types of back offs are, are clues to what's going on, right? So when you see this doubling of delays, it's a big clue that something is going wrong, and it's not artificial. It's typically the protocol doing it because they're built to back off, right, and keep waiting, exponential back off, etc. What else do we see here? Retransmission. Retransmission, right? Clearly it's retransmission. What else? Yeah, so same source destination. It's one direction, right? So immediately that jumps out. So what you need to do is you need to file this away and kind of process it and put it in the background and start to uh, when, and as you do your troubleshooting, things will start to emerge. Okay, so first, this is a good, good, as good a place as any to start. I'm going to clear this out. So let's do quick analysis. And this is something that trips up a lot of beginners when you're doing protocol analysis, that TCP is a two-way conversation, right? Most people concentrate in one direction, um, and in file transfer, it, it almost is just, you know, file packets going in one direction with acknowledgments going the other. So we're going to jump up here and take a look at some things, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is, this retransmission, Wireshark clearly says it's a retransmission, and uh, let's take a look, and it says sequence number 2401. So Wireshark tells you that I'm starting at 2401, and I've gone as far as 3329, okay? And all that is is I started at 2401, this is my left edge, I've sent 928 bytes, and uh, that adds up to 3329. Okay, that's all that means. So if you're doing like video and uh, editing or music editing, it's all it is is that slider window that you move around so you can bracket where you're looking at, right? Remember, TCP is a streams-oriented protocol. There is no start and end. It's just constant streaming of data. So all this is telling you is that I'm starting at this 2401 byte and going up to 3329, okay? So this is a retransmission, which means previous to this packet, there should be what? Original packet, so how do we find it? And sure enough, we see one here with the sequence number 2401, but what's different about it? I'm sorry? Smaller size. Is that a problem? I'm sorry, I, I... Should the retransmission be the same size as the original packet? Okay, so shouldn't the retransmission be the same packet? TCP is not a real transmission. It's not a TCP retransmission. It's not a TCP retransmission is one answer. 
Well, clearly it is TCP and it is a retransmission, right? It's not TCP host that's doing it? Okay, all right. So this is something that'll trip up people who say they know TCP, but don't really understand TCP. And the goal of this class is really to get you to think about what's happening in the background, right? So what's TCP's job? The textbook answer, TCP versus UDP. TCP is guaranteed delivery. How does it guarantee the delivery? Acknowledgements, okay. What else? It sets aside buffers, right? Because think about this, right? And you have to kind of go inside the stack to do this, but you're the TCP engine, you're the stack. The application gives you packets to send, okay? Once you get that, you have to set it aside into a buffer and you send it. And when you get an acknowledgement saying, hey, I'm the end system, I got it, I can throw it away from my buffer and get some more information, right? Because if that packet gets lost, I can't go back up to the application and say, hey, sorry, I, I, I lost that. Could you go back in time and, and send me that information? Applications can't do that, right? So your job as TCP to set aside that send buffer, hold on to those packets until you get a positive acknowledgement that the packet arrived. Okay, it's very simple in concept, but you have to think, so, so let's kind of take that logic and figure out what's happening. Here's our first packet that starts with 2401 and has a length of 88. But this retransmission is 982 bytes. What happened? Data. More data got into the sender's buffer. Why? Because TCP is streams oriented, right? There is no start and end. So, I sent the first packet with 142 bytes. Why? That's all I had in my buffer. Okay? So notice the time here. It's two seconds is an eternity, right? From a network standpoint, two seconds is eternity. So while I'm sitting here waiting for this packet and acknowledgement to come back, the application gave me more data. So when I'm ready to retransmit, because no one told me that this packet here, 2401, starting at 2401, I never got an acknowledgement that the other side received it. So instead of retransmitting packetized format, in other words, instead of resending this exact packet with 142 bytes, I have more stuff in my buffer, I might as well send it, right? So the thing that you have to pick out here is that just because you're looking for a retransmission, the packet sizes may not be the same, and it's not a problem. Because it just means that TCP is doing its job and being efficient. Okay? What else can we look at to troubleshoot this? 